Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back. Um, it's good to see you all. If you remember, I was a bit flustered last time we were together because basically what happened was uh, a friend of ours was taking care of the cats over the weekend and they were diagnosed with COVID like a couple days later and they were like in the house and we were of course like terrified and we ran out and got tests and I got my results today. They were negative and we're not out of the woods yet because my wife, um, Allison, we're still waiting on her results, but I mean, we're optimistic that they'll be negative as well. The whole situation is just like terrifying. And I really um, sympathize, you know, even more with anyone who's experienced this in their family for real, because the uncertainty is is nagging. And as you know, we're expecting our first child. So it's especially worrisome, the, the prospect that, you know, it was possible to contract COVID because her immune system is compromised and it would be very difficult or more difficult to overcome it. So we're not out of the woods and we just don't know yet what her results are, but, you know, we're optimistic at least that since mine are negative, hers will be too. So, I'm doing a little bit better today, um, but hopefully by Friday, I can tell you with certainty that we can uh, rule that out. Um, but it's very good to see you. Welcome back. As you know, we are discussing um, non-electoral political behavior. And that's a very encompassing rubric because it includes everything from strikes and protests to demonstrations and assemblies to uh, insurgency and uprising and re revolution. And these various political behaviors are not created equal as we know, but they all do have in common that they're non-electoral and they don't relate to voting or the traditional form of participation that we think of when we think about democracy. And this week and next week, we're focusing on social movements as one example of non-electoral behavior. And Social movements, as you know, concern those, those um, coordinated actions between people with a common identity or sense of shared fate and a common objective. And what social movements are characterized by above all, the dispersion of decision-making and a lack of a hierarchy or a bureaucratic organization, it really is more sort of amorphous and decentralized and it's about people power and not individuals or leaders or the concentration of power in anyone's hands, so much so as it is the democratization of that. And we talked about how social movements involve sustained claims on target authorities or sustained protests or uh, demands or calls for some kind of a concession. They also involve the creation of special purpose coalitions, processions or rallies or demonstrations, statements to the media, pamphlets. The toolkit of the social movement can be vast and, and varied, but the point is that social movements have a signature kind of approach or you know, set of actions that they take that, that distinguish them. And I'll show you in a minute what we mean by that. And then finally, displays of worthiness or strength or unity or numbers. People get together in large numbers. And the point of a social movement is to exhibit strength. And, and a social movement, by definition, uh, is about the, the number of people in the common purpose that, that they have. So these are the three elements of a social movement that we, that we last discussed. And one example that maybe you're familiar with is the umbrella movement, which is the pro-democracy movement in Hong Kong. And Hong Kong is really a class that we could devote a whole semester to in itself because it's such a complex and, and long conflict in the sense that the pro-democracy movement can go back multiple decades and really their demands have revolved around more autonomy and really autonomy from China. In Hong Kong, uh, 
they have really what's a form of protected democracy. It's not even really that, frankly. Elections are circumscribed, and so the candidates are pre-approved by China, mainland China. Uh, China has so, several times tried to advance and obtain the passage of extradition bills in Hong Kong that would permit China to basically extradite Hong Kong nationals to the mainland and be tried by, by Chinese uh, courts. It's also the case that in Hong Kong, the legislature, 40% of the seats are chosen and appointed by the business community, which is very closely aligned with China because of the economic relationships between China and Hong Kong and because of the, the really the dependence and the, the benefit that, that the business community in Hong Kong derives from its relationship with China. And so in virtually every way in Hong Kong, political life is circumscribed by China. And so the pro-democracy movement is all about freeing Hong Kong from China and achieving autonomy and independence for Hong Kong. And the conflict is so intense that it really even reaches across and it reaches the mainland here. In fact, maybe you've heard in the past, there have been intense debates about the significance or the, the, the sort of affiliation of Hong Kong. And one story is the story of a, a college student who said, I am from Hong Kong and wrote this online. And apparently this incited a backlash in an uproar among Chinese students who objected to the idea that anyone would say I'm from Hong Kong instead of I'm from China. But the whole point that I wanna to make to you is that the pro-democracy movement is, is absolutely enmeshed in, and encircles this entire context. And it revolves around this demand for freedom and autonomy and for democracy in, in Hong Kong. And so the umbrella movement, as I'll show you now, engages in these sustained confrontations with authorities, in, the, in particular, the police and the security forces in Hong Kong. And these go back many, many years. You can find videos on YouTube that, that demonstrate this in vivid detail. Here's one from 2014. And it just gives you a sense of both the sort of symbolism in the use of the umbrellas, but also the unity, the strength of the movement, the size of the movement, the confrontation with the authorities and the demand ultimately for uh, more autonomy. And in this case, what the movement is, is demanding in particular is the freedom to select the candidates for the 2017 election. Hong Kong uh, ultimately had to go with candidates that were pre-approved by China. And at this moment in time in 2014, the pro-democracy movement was demanding freedom from China in that sort of nomination process. And, and that's what you're witnessing here when I show you this video. So this is a good example of what a social movement looks like in, in, in motion. And um, we'll talk more about this in a moment. The pro-democracy movement is also infamous for these campus occupations. Um, in recent years, students who comprise really the bulwark of the movement occupied universities and came into very, very tense uh, conflict with authorities. And ultimately, in, in many of those cases, were forcefully and violently ejected and, and they're to this day facing um, prison sentences in, in harsh uh, punitive 
judgments by the authorities and the, the court system, partly because of the continued influence of, of China. But this is important because it goes to the willingness of the movement to engage in these very, very vivid confrontations and really at great expense. And before we continue, I'll add that, you know, it's not just in Hong Kong that students occupy universities. In Chile, the, the feminist movement is also legendary for um, taking over campuses, private and public. And in fact, that country has been riven with long-term uh, occupations and interruptions of, of normal um, academic terms for months at a time because of these occupations, always, always motivated by demands for improvements in education, uh, a sort of political reform or a set of political reforms that have often been advocated by student movements and in other movements. And, um, and, and in general, these social movements use these kinds of tactics. And this is what sets a, a, a social movement apart from say um, a coalition or a political party in the sense that the social movement is all about obtaining public notice or notoriety or getting the attention that otherwise would not be gotten. And it's done through these kinds of means, these, these sorts of uh, very visible and, and, and um, very eye-catching means. But social movements don't emerge everywhere. And what we know from the theoretical literature is that they only really form and become effective if we have four conditions in place. And these are sort of like the prerequisites for a, an effective and a lasting social movement. And the first one is the formation of a collective identity. The people in the movement need to share some sense of, of common identity or some sense of common um, origin or, or fate or some kind of sense that they're connected in that there's something about them fundamentally that they have in common. And it's, it's not a coincidence, for example, that many su successful social movements tend to draw on the same social group. So many successful social movements are motivated or, or largely driven by students or working class people or peasants uh, or, or um, middle class people or teachers, um, you name it, right? It's often the case that they, they share some social association or affiliation or, or identity that, that binds them in a, in a meaningful way and makes it possible for them to, to, to act collectively. The second one is they have to have a shared sense of, of ethics. They have to agree on what is right and wrong and what should and should not be done and, and what kinds of courses of action would be appropriate and what kinds would be inappropriate. What, so, what sorts of uh, tactics and strategies would be compatible with the goals that they have agreed on and that they have, have decided should, should orient their action. And then more generally, there should be collective agreement to change the status quo. You know, sometimes it's not possible to coordinate the members of a potential group because there's insufficient agreement among them about the need or the desirability or the uh, possibility of changing this, the status quo and therefore the, the need to even try in the first place. This is the, the collective action problem, which relates to the, the simple fact that members of a group um, are difficult to police. As the group gets larger, it becomes more difficult to monitor their behavior, their potential benefit gets smaller. Um, and more generally, organization costs rise with, with group size. For a variety of reasons, it's hard to get people to agree when they come together over some potential purpose or some course of action. And so many social movements have failed because they can't solve the collective action problem. And it's, it's significant that many social movements succeed partly because they've got a very rigid and frankly dogmatic ideological uh, basis or viewpoint that they begin with. Many social movements are communist. 
uh, or far right or nationalist. Um, many social movements are extremely progressive in demanding land reform or radical changes or improvements. It's not um, co a coincidence. And the reason that they often have a radical viewpoint is because it's a radical ideology that, that partly motivates them in the first place and leads them to agree on the need for, for change. Um, and then finally, it's, it's useful if there's a shared history of collective action. If they've done something together already, it becomes easier to do something together again. But frankly, I think that that's not essential because every social movement has a first, a first moment or a beginning. And um, you know they're not just eternal. So it certainly is the case that collective action can help to reinforce and, and sustain and perpetuate a social movement. But at, it, at the very start, they've, they've got to begin somewhere. And that's where organization and leadership in some way does become important. And I'll show you some examples here in a moment of, of social movements that stand out as, as noteworthy for uh, their objective or their goal or their eventual impact. And really the first social movement is Chartism or social movements like Chartism. This was a working class male suffrage movement in 19th century England, 1850s, 1860s, working class males, men who didn't own property um, and didn't have some landed status, they increasingly organized and, and demanded voting rights and the extension of the franchise to them. And this was a goal that many, many social movements throughout what we would now consider the, the old uh, democracies, this was a goal for many of them. In the earliest social movements, essentially sought to, to widen the franchise and to extend the vote. And it's understandable why that would be the case, because this is frankly the way that democracies and political systems have evolved. Um, we always should ask democracy for whom? In the earliest democracies were very, very narrowly tailored for the landed elites and the aristocratic and noble and bourgeois uh, privileged classes who owned land and had some claim to to, to status and power and influence. And so as these systems developed and as middle classes and working classes got larger and larger, they increasingly organized and increasingly demanded rights. And eventually these social movements prevailed in, in widening the franchise and attaining the, the right to vote. And of course, women in the women's rights movement has first and foremost been defined by the suffrage movement and the suffragettes and the United States, European countries all have uh, vivid histories of, of radical action by social movements, women's movements seeking to, to widen the franchise and extend the, the right to vote to women. And some of the most notorious acts of protest come from the women's suffrage movement. And there's actually a pretty good video about this. This video also puts in context a lot of the political uh, tactics and strategies of the suffragettes, the, suffra the suffrage movement, the women's suffrage movement. And um, I thought it would be useful for us to actually use this as an example of the ways that social movements engage in these sustained confrontations. They use vivid public acts to try to raise awareness and uh, obtain the attention of, of authorities, of the, the population, of those who might support them and lend more credibility to their cause. You have to remember that looking back, it's, it's easy for us to imagine that, that it was inevitable that we would extend rights to these groups, but by no means was it inevitable. These were all struggles that had to be hard fought and eventually won. And in the case of women's rights, it was no different. And, and so it became essential for these social movements to raise awareness through any means that they could. And this is where the story gets really interesting because they were so um, ingenious and creative in the way that they did. And so let's actually um, take a look at this and uh, reflect on this in a moment when we're done. British suffragettes were masters of spectacle. Their mission was to win British women the right to vote. And to do that, they needed attention. Their demonstrations were tightly choreographed events full of matching outfits and signs. 
but it was their radical actions that made them notorious. They smashed windows, destroyed fine art, and set fire to the houses of their political opponents, all in the name of keeping their fight on the front page of the paper and in the minds of the public. Newsreels from the time show the destruction the suffragettes left behind. But there's one act that stands out above the rest. It took place in 1913 at one of the most popular sporting events of the year, a horse race, where newsreel cameras captured a lone figure stepping onto the racetrack and doing this. She was holding a suffragette flag. Women had been petitioning for the vote in England since the mid 1800s. They were called suffragists and had a non-confrontational strategy of persuasion and education to convince legislators to give women the vote. But in 1903, a new branch emerged, the militant suffragists, whose motto was deeds, not words. Frustrated by the lack of progress, they began seeking attention by disrupting men's political meetings with loud heckling and getting arrested for things like spitting on policemen, prompting one newspaper in 1906 to call the noisy disruptors suffragettes, a name meant to diminish or mock the new militant activists as hysterical and childish, but one they embraced, even changing the name of their newspaper, Votes for Women, to The Suffragette. The militant suffragettes had a bad reputation in the press and drew criticism from the wider suffrage movement for taking it too far and setting progress back with their disruptive acts. The suffragettes were depicted as unfeminine and crazed, so public pageantry and controlling their image was an important part of the movement. They saw themselves as crusaders for women's freedom, so every detail was worked throughout to make sure they made a huge visible impact spectacle was part of the drama of their campaign. They delivered speeches, made colorful banners, marched, and got arrested in public again and again, usually wearing their official color scheme, purple for loyalty, green for hope, and white, which represented the virtue of their campaign, but also read well in sepia tone news photos. They did make a all their surroundings. But the militant suffragettes' publicity strategy changed in late 1910. A riot breaks out in Parliament Square, and that day became known as Black Friday because about 150 women were physically and sexually assaulted by the police. From here forward, the suffragettes organized fewer public demonstrations where they'd be surrounded by police, shifting instead to a radical approach of random acts of property destruction. And that's when you start to get nationwide vandalism. The telephone wires are cut, windows are smashed, boarding facilities are attacked. As their actions became more and more extreme in the early 1910s, the militant suffragettes became notorious villains in the media and in public opinion. But their message was clear. The destruction won't stop until a suffrage bill passes. Emily Wilding Davison was one of the most extreme of the militant suffragettes, and no stranger to violence. She once beat a man that she had mistaken for a politician with a horsewhip. She also set fire to mailboxes, inspiring some suffragettes to follow her radical example. She was jailed nine times, and while imprisoned, would go on hunger strike, and was subsequently force-fed through her nose, an extremely painful form of torture that the government enacted on many hunger-striking suffragettes to prevent them from dying of starvation in prison. Davison was willing to die in the name of women's liberation. During one of her imprisonments in 1912, she threw herself from a prison balcony in a suicide attempt to draw public sympathy for the suffragettes undergoing torturous force feeding in jail. She said afterward, if I had succeeded, I'm sure that forcible feeding could not in all conscience have been resorted to again. The following year is when Davison pushed her dedication to deeds, not words, to the most extreme. At the 1913 Epsom Derby. The Epsom Derby is England's most prestigious horse race, a beloved and historic event that's been run since 1780. That year, over 500,000 people were in attendance. King George V was there too. His horse, Anmer, was running the race. And in the crowded inner track, Emily Davison stood near Tottenham Corner. It's the final turn right before the sprint to the finish line. A prominent spot sure to be in view of the cameras, which were positioned around the track covering important parts of the race. In the footage, you can see Davison duck under the rail and wait for the leading pack of horses to go by, then step out onto the track right in front of Anmer, the king's horse. She was holding the purple, white, and green flag of the militant suffragettes. 
Emily Davison brought the two-ton racehorse crashing to the ground and flipped its rider. She died four days later of her injuries. After years of escalating militant violence was photographed after the fact or imagined in news illustrations, this was the first and only act of militant suffragette violence captured on film. And it was a huge story. People responded with a mix of shock and outrage. Davison was framed as a radical who ruined something everyone loves, the Derby. For the suffragettes, she became a martyr. The next issue of their magazine featured Davison as an angel on the cover, standing on a racetrack. They organized a massive public funeral where 5,000 suffragettes wearing white dresses and black armbands marched in solemn procession through London, carrying Davison's casket from Victoria Station to King's Cross Station to be sent to her hometown for burial. 50,000 people watched it go by. When you see photographs of it going through the streets, you see the sidewalk is packed with people. People are crammed onto the balconies looking at these women like, Oh, it's somebody like her. She threw herself at the king's horse and she has died. The spectacle of Davison's funeral brought sympathy for the struggle of women's suffrage to a global level. And, as it turns out, was basically the last public procession of the militant suffragettes. World War I broke out the following year, and the suffragettes put their militant activities on hold to contribute to the war effort. Suffrage is extended to women over 30 in 1918, and full suffrage passed in 1928. Emily Davison's shocking final protest at the Derby probably didn't change many people's minds about women's suffrage. And whether or not she intended to die remains unclear. She didn't tell anyone her plan, and she didn't leave a note. But this moment, caught on camera, became one of the most publicized acts of suffragette protest. One so extreme that no one, not even the king himself, could ignore. There's so many great archival photos and illustrations from the suffragette movement that I didn't have time to include in this video, like this cartoon. It was published in a British magazine in 1910 and is called The Suffragette That Knew Jiu-Jitsu. It shows terrified police officers surrounding a lone woman standing in front of a Votes for Women sign with a few of their comrades tossed onto the fence behind her. It might seem like a parody or a joke, but the thing is, suffragettes really did train in jiu-jitsu. As a response to the continued aggression by London police during demonstrations, like on Black Friday, the suffragettes hired Edith Margaret Garrett, a professional martial arts instructor, to teach them how to defend themselves during riots. It's sort of unclear how often the suffragettes used this specific skill set during their clashes with police, but newspapers at the time claimed these jujitsu experts could throw a 200 pound police officer over their heads. Ouch. <laughs> so there you have it. <clears throat> But it's a good example of the, the use of spectacle to elicit sympathy and change hearts and minds. And it's noteworthy because it goes to that toolkit that I talked about, the way that social movements succeed when they not only have numbers and unity and strength and discipline and identity, but also something novel. You know, so the example of the landless workers movement in Brazil, they succeed because they're very large and united, but they squat and they squat on unused land and they occupy and appropriate land in this way. In the case of the suffragettes, they were very uh, focused on spectacle and arousing the sympathy, changing the hearts and the minds of, of the population and eventually obtaining the right to vote. The Chartists were in a similar way focused on obtaining the right to vote. And all of these examples highlight the activity of the social movement, the targeted authorities, and then the repertoire or the, the particular way that the social movement goes about imposing that claim. And I'll give you um, a few more examples just to try to illustrate this in, in more detail. The Campesino movement in Colombia is another good example of a social movement. This movement emerged in opposition to efforts to liberalize Colombian coffee markets by uh, essentially easing some of the import tariffs that had been in, are still imposed on imports of coffee. In Colombia, Coffee farmers are numerous in number. 
And in general, coffee farmers have been well organized in efforts to oppose market reforms in various agricultural sectors. And the Campesino movement emerged in this context and continues to this day to, to very effectively oppose efforts to liberalize agricultural markets. And they use protests and demonstrations and um, they're very visible and very well organized and disciplined. And they're largely peasants and farmers. And you know they're not uh, particularly rich people. They have in common that they depend on farming and, and their product. And in particular, they would be very negatively affected by significant market reform. And that's why they've focused their efforts on combating liberalization in the in the agricultural sector. This is a photo from Colombia. But social movements aren't necessarily uh, always peaceful. In fact, there's nothing about the definition that implies peaceful means uh, or peaceful organization. In fact, there are many examples of social movements also very distinctive and notable for their, for their violent means. In Sendero Luminoso or Shining Path in Peru is one classic example. Uh, this has struggle for a, a peace accord, but in reality, it, it was a group that, that, that used violent means. They were labeled a terrorist organization. They were focused in a similar way as the guerrillas in Colombia on um, land redistribution, on what they viewed as a more egalitarian um, distribution of, of land and other resources. They were concerned about the, the, the well being and the conditions of peasants and people in the country. Um, but of course, they were different than, than, than groups in Colombia, and they had some of their own concerns and some of their own considerations. But again, there was a very important role for radical ideology, or at least a, a rigid, you know, far left ideology in this case. But there are also social movements that are far right in orientation. In, in radical in the other direction. The point is that a social movement can be peaceful uh, or violent in its means. And there's nothing about the definition that, that presupposes a, a peaceful group. Um, I'd like us to step back now and pause and have a, a discussion. And I'm in particular interested in talking to you about what social movements can achieve that groups of voters cannot? And you know the the context for this question is that this is this is a class a class on political behavior, and we focused for the most part on voting and why people vote, why they vote the way they do, and a lot of this discussion has assumed that voting is not just a critical way of influencing policy and governance, but maybe the most important way. But I think that it's possible that social movements can achieve things that groups of voters cannot. And I'm not suggesting that we have to choose between a social movement and voting. We don't have to choose. They're not mutually exclusive. One doesn't negate the other. We could do both, but I'm curious in a theoretical sense, what social movements can achieve potentially that, that voters cannot achieve? What can we do with the social movement that we can't do going to the polls? Um, you know, can we talk about this? Can we have a conversation with someone like to, to reflect on that or, or give us a, some idea what their viewpoint might be? I think that it can achieve attention and sort of a call to action in a way that a group of voters cannot, because when you're voting, you're usually voting for a particular candidate and or a referendum, but a social movement can draw attention to a particular legislative action that you want. For example, the Black Lives Matter movement drew attention to the amount of dollars that were going to police funding. That's a that's a really excellent point. So I'm actually going to um, 
here. Uh, let me open up a, hold on, document, and we can work on this together because I want to do this as a class. So you should be seeing a, a document and Okay, so this is such a critical point. And if you're not seeing the document, tell me, but I think you are. The question is what can social movements achieve that the groups of voters cannot? If these are types of political action, you know, what differentiates them and what can we possibly do that, that we can't do at the voting booth? And Ishan points out that, look, social movements, one of the strengths of the social movement is that they can shape the legislative agenda. You can call attention to something that you want it's not already on the agenda. And in that regard, you can actually shape the agenda. So for instance, you can put the, the, the right to vote for women or for uh, incarcerated people or for working class males on the agenda if it's not already there. By contrast, if you're a voter, you sort of have to choose between the legislative agendas that have already been chosen for you by the party or by the candidate whom you are potentially supporting in going to the, the voting booth and in casting your vote on election day. That's a really important difference. And uh, I think that the key here is to note that social movements, because of their novel means and because of their capacity to gain uh, sympathy and public support, they can shape the agenda proactively. They don't have to confine themselves to reacting to those agendas set before them and, and shaped for them by, by politicians. And that's one of the most important differences of all, to be honest, uh, recognizing that social movements have the capacity to change the agenda. And I would reckon and suggest to you that many, if not most of the most important innovations in policy and social policy in particular in the United States have been, you know, they've been brought onto the agenda in the first place by social movements. And so the right to vote for women, um, the right to vote for other groups, the civil rights movement that eventually was manifested in, in legislative uh, victories for, for civil rights. These all began as social movements. And in that regard, they shaped the eventual legislative agenda. They didn't respond to the agenda, they shaped it. Chandon says the group of voters tend to keep their identity anonymous, but a social movement allows people to change people's views through speeches and get their views out more clearly. But I think people in a social movement can remain anonymous too, right? And it's sort of about the, about the group or about the actions of, of many people as opposed to one. So I don't know if that's necessarily a difference. Courtney says it provides unity. But remember that we, we said that one of the rules or one of the requirements for a successful social movement is that it has to have collective agreement about changing the status quo. So it sounds like unity has to exist already for a social movement to, to exist. Now it's possible that it might reinforce the unity, but you know, presumably voting and going to the polls and voting for a certain party or being mobilized by a certain candidate can also provide unity. I don't know if that's something that's different about a social movement. Uh, I just wanna provoke deeper thought and I want us to reflect as much as possible on this and think about the concept and think about you know, the, the, the substantive differences. Okay, so Tessa says, the way I see it, institutions can only change as much as they allow. In, in, in that way, Tess is saying that, look, when you're voting, you're 
you're going and you're participating in the ch in the channels and in the lanes that have already been created for you, right? And in that regard, you can only change politics or decision making as much as those lanes in those channels allow and they're designed to constrain you in a variety of ways. And we can talk about, for example, how democracies can often be set up to privilege elites and really minimize the role of, of the electorate, even when voting is the most important act. But we'll leave that as an aside. And Tessa continues and says, social movements can create space for institutional reform. That is it right there. That's the key. They shape the agenda. And they do that by creating space and creating a wedge or creating some basis for some innovation or some change or some some new policy uh, that is that is not on the agenda already and that constitutes a reform of the existing system and that constitutes a break with the system that is not up for debate when you go to the polls necessarily but may be up for revision if that social movement is capable of creating that space. And that's such a good way of putting it, Tessa. Brittany says, social movements may be faster and encourage the public and media to form agendas that matter most to them, whereas voters take much longer to influence the agenda. So I'm not gonna place all of the uh, responses on, on here um, because we have so many of them. I'm going to incorporate as many of them as I can because I've been sharing the notes with you on CAT courses. Such a good way of putting it, Tessa. I completely agree. And I think that that's a way to think about it that is useful because it, highlights that social movements succeed by creating space as opposed to operating within lanes that, that um, are already left to us. So, so Brittany says that social movements may be faster. You know, it's, it's a good point, Brittany, because with a social movement, you don't need to wait for the next election, right? You can go out and petition or assemble or demonstrate today or right now. And in that regard, you're not hemmed in by the, the, the political constraints that are relevant to, say, a politician. You're kind of freed from some of those, and you might be able to have a, a, a more rapid influence that's an interesting and important point. I think that that's true, you know, because you don't have to operate within the institutional confines of the system, you can work more quickly. Really good points. I like that a lot. Aiden says social movements can provide faster results. You pressure the legislature into giving in and reforming. When you vote, you cannot always see the results. So um, I'm actually going to go, uh, I'm going to take something from Aiden's comment and, and, and kind of amplify it a little bit and so that we have a, a, a slightly different point than, than Brittany's point. What Aiden's pointing out is that social movements have the capacity to alt to, to change the costs and benefits of different alternatives or po as politicians face them of the different pol alternatives faced by politicians. And in that way, by changing the costs and benefits of the different alternatives, you can force them or compel them to act in a way that they otherwise would not. What we're actually describing is a, is a power relationship. Social movements in this regard can be said to exert power where they 
successfully I like this, we can go into more detail. Jacqueline says social movements publicly state what they want in the way they want it. When it comes to voting for it, it can be slightly changed or altered and it, it may not be exactly written or do what the voters would have wanted. Good, Jacqueline. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and kind of rephrase that, but take the kernel of that and, and amplify that. And I think the main point here is that uh, social movements can define their preferences precisely in the way that, hold on, let me go back. Okay, <laughs> can, can define their own preferences. They do not need to, their, I think that's a useful way of putting it by politicians, parties, or so social movements can define their own preferences, can define and they do not need to, I don't think we need to say anything else. I think that's a good way of putting it. Good, Jacqueline. Good, good. So I think that this is a very, very, very robust, set of points that we have here that we're working with in that help us to continue mining this concept and exploring this. I'm going to stop the share and then um, reconnect with the slides and give me a moment here. So we're actually um, out of time and that's okay because we are done for today and we will continue on Friday where we will pick up and look at some examples and talk more about the strength of social movements and in other issues. Uh, thanks so much for being here, everybody. Good to see you as always. Useful discussion. I'll save our notes and I'll upload them along with the slides and the lecture and uh, I'll see you on Friday. Take it easy.